Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to the Lord's house this morning here at St. Paul's. We're glad that you're here um, on this fourth Sunday in Lent. Before we begin worship, just want to draw to your attention some things in our congregation's life for Bible study. For this Sunday and next Sunday, um, we're going to be meeting downstairs in the lower level instead of up here. Off in our decks, we've got a, another group that's going to be using that these two Sundays. So, uh, Acts Bible study downstairs. Uh, and also, in two weeks, we'll be celebrating Easter, and with that, our Easter breakfast as well. And uh, Tara and the group that are helping lead it, there are some sign-up sheets for any kind of donations that you might consider. Um, it's out there on the script table in the narthex. I encourage you to take a look at that. And uh, if you have any questions, Tara can help answer those. That is it for our announcements. Our worship today, we're continuing our theme, uh, the places of the passion, as we follow Jesus um, during Holy Week, and today we're gonna find him in the courtyard, uh, and the teaching that God has for us is that grace is always so much better than guilt, and that's gonna be the theme that drives our worship. And with that, I invite you to stand as we call on God's name. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, let us ever walk with Jesus. To behold the gift of his forgiveness. And to marvel at the magnitude of his mercy. our sin to God our Father, trusting in his forgiveness in Jesus Christ. Heavenly Father, hear us as we confess. In the light of your holiness, I see myself as I really am. By nature sinful and unclean, I confess that I have endured thoughts and unclean words. I often think to hide with myself and to little of others. I cling too tightly to the treasures of this world. But I be walking the path of sin as I wander from your ways and in your goodness. Forgive me, I pray, for the sake of Jesus, and set me again on the path that leads to life, so that I can look forward to your name. Amen. And upon your confession, I do have good news for you. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his only Son, Jesus, to die for you and for his sake. 
God forgives you all your sins. As pastor, then, it's my joy to announce that grace of God to all of you and in the stead by the command of Jesus to forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And the Lord be with you. And also with you. Let me pray. Almighty God, Heavenly Father, your mercies are new every morning. And though we have in no way deserved your goodness, you still abundantly provide for all of our wants of body and soul. Give us, we pray, for your Holy Spirit, that we may acknowledge your loving goodness towards us, give thanks to all of your practice, and serve you in your own peace. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and rules with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. And you may be seated for the word. The Old Testament reading for this fourth Sunday in Lent is from the prophet Isaiah from the 53rd chapter. Isaiah prophetically seeing the work that Jesus would come to do. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people? And they made his grave with the wicked, and with the rich man in his death, although he had done no violence, and there was no deceit in his mouth. And yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He, was, he has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for sin, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. And therefore I will divide him in a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many, and makes intercession for the transgressors. This is the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. And our epistle from James' letter in chapter 2. James, James writes, If you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You are doing well. But if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in even one point has become accountable for all of it. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. If you do not commit adultery but do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So speak and so act as those who are to be judged under the law of liberty. For judgment is without mercy to one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And I invite you to stand for the reading of the Gospel. The Holy Gospel is according to St. Matthew from the 26th chapter. Now Peter was sitting outside in the courtyard, and a servant girl came up to him and said, You also were with Jesus the Galilean. But he denied it before them all, saying, I do not know what you mean. And when he went out to the entrance, another servant girl saw him, and she said to the bystanders, Well, this man was with Jesus of Nazareth. And again, Peter denied it with an oath, I do not know the man. After a little while, the bystanders came up and said to Peter, Oh, certainly you're one of them. Your accent betrays you. Then Peter began to invoke a curse on himself and to swear, I do not know the man. And immediately the rooster crowed. And Peter remembered the saying of Jesus, Before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise you, O Christ. Be seated.
grace and peace to you from our Savior Jesus. Amen. And the word that God has to comfort us this day is that word from the gospel from the courtyard seen in Matthew 26. And we've already shared that word, so I invite you to join me in a word of prayer. Lord God, may the words of my mouth, may the meditations of our heart, may they always be pleasing to you, God, who are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Fifty years ago, Neil Coward, a famous British playwright, once played a joke on, on 20 of the most famous, prominent men in London. He sent all 20 men an identical note that read, Everybody has found out what you've done. If I were you, I would leave town. So what did all 20 men do? All 20 left town. I mean, think about it. What if you opened up in the mail one day a note that said that? Everybody has found out what you have done. If I were you, I would get out of town. I mean, what would race through your mind? What would everybody know that you did from the past? What whisper from the past would pop into your mind and settle in your heart? It's called a G word. And it's ugly. The G word is guilt. I mean, sometimes guilt can sit on our chest like a concrete block until we feel sick. I mean, sick enough to die. This is how, this is how King David once reacted to his guilt. He prayed it in Psalm 32. He said, when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night, God, your hand was heavy on me. Your, my strength was sapped as in the heat of the summer. And that's the outcome of guilt. Maybe there's someone on the planet who hasn't known guilt. This quagmire of remorse. Maybe there's an ongoing person who doesn't know what guilt is. This ongoing whisper in your mind that you're worthless. But I've never met that person. I mean, what sucked you under? Was it that one mistake, that one night stand, cheating on your income taxes, or some test on school that you cheated on? I mean, what was it? The time that you threw your best friend under the bus just to save your own face? Maybe it wasn't the guilt that was a result of a single moment, but maybe it's a season of life. Maybe you failed as a parent or a spouse, squandered away your youth or your money or, or both. And the result? Guilt. Guilt. It never wants to relinquish its grip. Guilt. It isolates you, corners you. Guilt always threatens to expose the scars of your past. It's the whispering voice that keeps haunting you about what you thought was finished, but guilt says it's not. Today we're going to keep walking through this series in Matthew called Places of the Passion, and today we're going to visit the courtyard in Jerusalem, the courtyard of the high priest named Caiaphas. And in Caiaphas's courtyard, we see guilt. Specifically, Peter's guilt. But this morning, I want you to see your own as well. Because beyond the courtyard, we also are going to see grace. Grace for Peter and grace for us. Now, to get the context, we've got to rewind the tape and go back a little bit previous to this night in this courtyard scene, back to the Gethsemane Garden. And there in the garden comes the claim. When Jesus said to the disciples, that if you are all going to run away from me, Peter answered him and said, though they all fall away because of you, I will never fall away. So Jesus said to him, truly I say to you, this very night before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And Peter's claim, Peter said to him, even if I must die with you, I will never deny you. I mean, there's the claim. Jesus and Peter. I mean, think about them. They've been through so much. Three years together. Jesus was walking on the North Shore. This is where it began. Jesus was walking on the North Shore with them on the Sea of Galilee. And, and Jesus sees Peter and a fisherman. And he calls him and his brother from the boat. And he says, come follow me. And I will make you fishers of men. And immediately he drops his net and follows him. Peter and Andrew both follow Jesus. One day... Later, maybe about a year later, 
Peter follows Jesus out onto the Sea of Galilee, and it's a wheel of a storm. And Jesus is there walking on the water toward them and invites Peter to come, come to me, Peter. Peter hops out of the boat and he follows. He's walking towards Jesus on the water. But he takes his eyes off and begins to sink. And immediately it says Jesus reaches out his hand and saved him. At Caesarea Philippi, maybe a year later, well, when Jesus asked the question of all questions, he says, who do you say that I am? It's Peter. It's Peter who responds. It's Peter who says about Jesus, you are the Christ. You are the son of the living God. And after that, Jesus takes Peter along with James and John to the top of the mountain of transfiguration. They see Jesus' glory. Then in the garden, Jesus invites that same trio to witness his sorrow and his anguish. There's nobody closer to Jesus than Peter. I mean, there's no wonder Peter makes the claim. Even if I must die with you, I will never deny you, Jesus. But we make that claim too. Yeah. I mean, think about your confirmation day. Maybe you stood here at this altar and you were asked a pretty serious question that day. The pastor asked you, and do you intend to live according to the word of God in faith and word and deed and remain faithful to Jesus even to the point of death? You were asked that. Remember that? And God willing, you said, I will. The claim. At your wedding, you were asked, will you give yourself to this person to serve them as husband or as wife, to love him, to comfort him, to honor and protect them, and forsaking all others to be faithful to him or her as long as you both shall live? That answer, I will. That's God willing, you answered, I will. The claim. To always be faithful. Oh, the claim. It's so easy. Oh, it's so easy to say. But it's really never easy to do. And all of that exposes the cracks. Now, as the events in the courtyard unfold, it's like watching cracks in a house's foundation slowly spread its way deeper and deeper. A serving girl comes up to Peter and says, oh, you were with Jesus the Galilean. Peter denies it, saying, I don't know what you mean. First crack. And then Peter moves out to the courtyard's entrance, where another serving girl sees him, and she says to the bystanders, oh, this man, surely he was with Jesus of Nazareth. And again, Peter denies it. This time, though, he denies it with an oath. I do not know the man. Second crack. When there are enough cracks, you know what happens. They'll all be a collapse. Always. And then it happens. The collapse. I gotta get a new clicker. I ain't gonna find my slide here. The collapse. After a little while, the bystanders came up and they said to Peter, Certainly you are one of them, for your accent betrays you. And then, and then Peter began to invoke a curse on himself and to say, I do not know the man. Now we know from first century documents that the Jews in Galilee they spoke a different language, a different dialect. They had an accent, give them away. Like when we hear somebody from the South, we know they're from the South. Peter's accent gives them away. What did Peter do? Now the expression that it says he invokes a curse on himself is where we get an English word called anathematize. Anathema. It means literally to be eternally condemned. Paul uses that word in Galatians 1 when he writes, if anybody preaches a gospel to you other than what I preach, let him be anathema. Let him be eternally condemned. You see it. Peter would rather be condemned than admit that he knows this Jesus. 
First, Peter has an evasive denial. Then, then a direct denial with an oath. And now Peter is willing to be condemned to curse himself. I don't know him. What's next? Well, immediately Matthew said the rooster crowed. And the crack leads to the collapse. For us it happens when we say, just, just one more drink. Or just one more lie. Or just one more look. Or just one more charge that I know I can't afford. Crack. 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 But the one more leads to one more. And then just one more. And when there are enough cracks, there will always be a collapse. Always. And then what? Guilt. The guilt that never wants to relinquish its, its grip on you. The guilt that isolates you, corners you. The guilt that always threatens to expose the scars. Whispering voice that keeps haunting you about the past. And when the collapse happens, what are your options? You could numb it. Numb it with a drink during happy hour. Numb it by binge shopping. Numb it through internet games or binge eating or binge drinking or binge TV watching. You could try to numb it or deny it. Pretend the rooster never crowed. Concoct a plan to cover it all up. One lie, though, leads to another lie and then another lie. And before long, you adjust that second lie to align with the first lie, and then the third lie begins to crumble and fall apart. You could numb it or you could deny it, but neither works. Bury it, I suppose. Bury your guilt beneath a mountain of work and a calendar of appointments. The busier we stay, the less time we spend thinking about the one person that we dislike the most and ourselves. You could punish it. Cut yourself, flog yourself, or maybe not with whips, but with rules. Create a long list of things to do, pray more, study more, show up earlier, stay later. Minimize it, that works, maybe, I don't know. We didn't sin, we just kind of lost our way. Oh, we didn't sin, we just got caught in the moment. We didn't sin, we just took a wrong path. Redirect it, people try it. Lash out at the kids, lash out at your spouse, your co-workers, your cat, your dog, the driver in the next lane. I mean, just lash out to whoever. Offset it. Try to build the perfect family, create the perfect career, score perfect grades, be completely intolerant of mistakes by yourself or other people. Guilt. The G word. It turns us into miserable, weary, angry, stressed out people. Guilt. You can numb it, deny it, bury it, punish it, minimize it, redirect it, offset it. Try it, but it doesn't work. Guilt sucks the life right out of you. Always. But grace restores it. Let me say that again. Guilt always sucks the life right out of you. But grace restores it. You see, there's a, a better way to deal with guilt. You want to know it? The best way? The best way to deal with guilt? Confess it. Peter when the rooster crows, went out and wept bitterly. When, when Peter's life collapsed there in that courtyard, he didn't numb it with his guilt. He didn't deny it. He didn't bury it. He didn't punish it, minimize it. He didn't redirect it or offset it. Peter confessed his guilt. Period. 
he went out and he wept before the Lord bitterly. And while Peter went outside the courtyard to confess, Jesus was going to the cross to die. Jesus doesn't wait till we get it all together. Jesus doesn't wait until we overcome our temptations. Jesus doesn't wait so we can fight our demons and conquer our sin. Jesus doesn't wait for us. Remarkably, instead, Jesus goes out to the cross to die. To be the substitute in place of those who deserve to die. Paul puts it remarkably this way in Romans 8. He said that God showed his love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. It's not that when we sinners cleaned up our act and tried to numb or deny or offset our guilt, he died for us. No. While we were still sinners, denying in a courtyard, Christ died for us. In our courtyards of life, it's easy to see our guilt. Beyond our courtyard, though, we see grace. That God, in an undeserved favor, is willing to die for us, but we don't deserve it. Grace always restores. Grace allows for U-turns so that there can be a comeback. It did for Peter. The comeback. Oh my gosh. The comeback. 53 days later, you know that's right. 53 days after his collapse in the courtyard, who is standing in the, the city of Jerusalem preaching about Jesus? Who's telling the crowds about how they crucified Jesus, the chosen one from God, but God raised him from the dead? Who's preaching it? Well, it's the comeback kid. It's Simon Peter. And it's a message that day that converts 3,000 people. Who ends up in the house of a Roman centurion to tell the Gentiles in that home about the love of God and how God doesn't show favorites, but that he has come for everyone? It's Simon Peter. Listen closely. Comebacks do not depend on how much you love Jesus. Comebacks depend upon how much Jesus loves you. Comebacks do not depend upon what you do for Jesus. Comebacks depend upon what Jesus does for you. Comebacks do not depend upon you giving up your life for Jesus. Comebacks depend upon Jesus giving his life for you. Guilt will always suck the life out of you. But God's grace will always restore you. That's what we see out in the courtyard. That our story isn't over. Not when Jesus is in it. I mean, isn't that great? That simple phrase. Your story isn't over when Jesus is in it. We can all come back from guilt. How? The only way possible. Through grace. God's grace and what it means. That there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus our Lord. Your story isn't over when Jesus is in it. Amen? And may the peace of God, then, that transcends all understanding, guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. We have the opportunity now and joy to worship our God, presenting before him a, a token of the sacrifice of our lives back to him and the gifts and the offerings that we bring.
joy and privilege of standing with Christians throughout the world and throughout the ages and confessing the same faith that we have in our God and all that he has done for us. This morning, again, we use the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, Jesus and for all people in their needs. Mm -hmm. Heavenly Father, you love the world in such a way that you gave your only Son, that he could free us from sin and the guilt that we can sometimes have hanging over us and crushing us. We thank you for his obedient death on a cross that offered to us full forgiveness and no condemnation for us who are in him. God, we confess that without that love we would be lost. But you have brought us back and restored us to his grace. We praise you and thank you, Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. And Lord of the church, we thank you for the treasure of that good news. That by your spirit, you would keep us and our eyes fixed on Jesus, who is the author and finisher of our faith. God, strengthen then our determination to keep following you. To, as forgiven people, to do what pleases you, no matter the danger or the cost. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. And God, we pray today for those who carry a cross in the name of Jesus and who face ridicule and persecution for the sake of the kingdom. We pray for missionaries and chaplains who serve in so many different places, for young people who stand up for what is right in the face of pressure to do what is wrong, for all, Lord, who pay a high price for their faith and for their values as Christians. By your Spirit, Lord, grant them patience and endurance. Lord, in your mercy. God, we pray for all those who carry heavy burdens in this life. Today we pray for the sick and the chronically ill, the depressed and the lonely, those who are torn by conflict and personal relationships, those victimized by war or injustice, and all who face the terrors of life with heavy hearts. God, grant them peace, and in your mercy, be their guardian and their friend, their comfort and hope. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. And let us pray for those who care for others, for doctors and nurses, for social workers and caring friends, for teachers, pastors, and counselors, for all who feed the hungry, who comfort the hurting, who stand beside the dying. God, strengthen them in their work, and do not let them become weary in doing good. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. And today, God, we thank and praise you for the the life-giving waters of baptism and the welcoming grace that will be given to Zoe Hartrick as she's baptized into Christ. Be with her, Lord, that she might continue in that faith that you give her to lead a godly life and to praise and honor of you. Strengthen her, her parents, Paul and Alicia, to have the endurance to raise their child in the love and the nurture of Jesus as you call them to do. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Help us then run with patient endurance the race that's marked out before us. And keep us faithful, Lord, even to the point of death, that we would receive the crown of life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. 
Amen. And the Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Lord. And let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give Him thanks and praise. It is truly good, right, and proper that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, and everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who accomplished the salvation of mankind by the tree of the cross, so that where death arose, their life might also rise again, and that the serpent overcame by a tree of the garden might likewise by the tree of the cross be overcome. And therefore with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we together laud and magnify your glorious name evermore praising you and saying Jesus then on the night that he was betrayed took the bread and when he had given thanks he broke it. He gave it to his disciples saying take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. This do to remember me. And in the same way also Jesus took the cup after supper and when he had given thanks he gave it to them saying drink of it all of you. This is my blood in the New Testament that is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And may the peace of the Lord be with you always.
thanks to the Lord, for he is good. We give thanks to you, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this sacramental gift. And we ask you that of your mercy you would strengthen us through the same in faith toward you and in serving love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Jesus invites us to walk with him to the high priest's courtyard, a place of great suffering and a place of great love. We will walk with Jesus then all the way to the empty tomb and resurrection victory. Let us ever walk with Jesus. Now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and always give you peace. Amen. Amen.